Hi everyone and welcome to ABC's Anesthesia. My name is Lahiri and today on this podcast episode and YouTube episode, I've got Dr. Tim Tran. Now, Tim, you've been with us before as an exemplar of uh, interview, <laughs> of, of how to do a proper interview. Um, yeah. But yeah, tell us a bit about yourself, where you're at. And, um, what, and so essentially, we're going to be talking about stoic philosophy. And we just happened to chat about this stuff, um, kind of just casually. And I thought this would be a great thing to talk about on a podcast and the way it relates to medicine and anesthesia. Uh, so Tim, yeah, tell us a bit about yourself and yeah, where you at. Yeah, sure. So thanks, Larry. I'm I'm Tim. Um, I'm an anesthetics registrar BT1 in Queensland, and I did a PHO year um, with L, who also interviewed on this channel um, last year. And so I use the ABCs of anesthesia fairly extensively for the interview prep, and um, and then I use the sibling channel, also run by Lahiri, but also Stan Tay, called uh, Anesthesia Coffee Break particularly extensively for some of my primary preparation. And for the primary exam, I found that immensely helpful, particularly some of the older um, episodes, like episodes one through 40, are catered towards people writing the written exam and find it very helpful. And some of the earliest episodes talk about strategies to approach the MCQs, SAQs, and an overall study plan. And I found that all immensely helpful. So recently, um, passed the primary in October. And yeah, it just was... Um, Lahiri came out to meet our study group for lunch because everyone passed in study group, which is pretty awesome. And just wanted to say thanks because you've been a big part of my journey. Yeah, Tim, you were kind enough to lend me this book, really, um, or give me this book, which is The Daily Stoic. And, and it's just this great book with lots of good snippets of old quotes with you know how they relate to kind of modern day. And I thought this would be a great podcast to chat to you about. your are past your primary. Life is great. And you know how stoic philosophy really affects and helps you in your life because I think you're you're quite into it. Hey Tim, so just I guess briefly, how did stoic philosophy and mindfulness help you in your application process and the exam? And again, you know this early part of your career. Uh, so I'd say it's very relevant in three ways. Uh, firstly, in day to day practice. Now, um, and secondly, they're very quotable in interviews, which helps with getting onto anesthesia. And thirdly, it's um, very useful. Uh, to really overcome the adversity of the primary exam. And so just with the relevance to day-to-day -day practice, so we'll get into a bit of detail about that. Uh, but note that I'm a relatively new adopter only over the last two, three years, but it's been immensely helpful over that period of time. Uh, secondly, with the interviews, um, the Queensland Anesthetic Rotation Training Scheme, they're pretty big on stress minimization and also situational crises. And I'm really put to the forefront uh, these two things, so st stoicism and mindfulness in how I handle those situations. And then thirdly, uh, with the primary exam, it's a, a huge obstacle. And so stoicism is all about overcoming obstacles and mindfulness is always just about being in the present moment, chipping away day by day, which is ultimately the best approach to the, to the exam. That sounds like a great summary. Yeah, let's get started. Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess we can start with what is stoicism? Uh, so it's philosophy of ancient Greeks and Romans. Um, and you might think, oh, how come like a 2,000-year-old philosophy is more relevant to the modern day? And it's experienced quite a bit of a renaissance in the last couple of years, particularly with COVID. I think yeah, um, it has a couple of strategies to deal with adversity, which has been pretty prevalent over the last few years. Um, and so I can go into a little bit about its components. Um, such as like the trichotomy of control, negative visualization, and setbacks and framing. So that's all to do with how we approach situations yeah. uh, and what we can control, what we can't control. Actually, that's and really good. Like literally, I'd never heard about Stoic philosophy in this way until COVID. And suddenly it was kind of coming up through media and through these courses I've done online. And yeah. like, oh, wow, this is actually really... And a lot of it's stuff that you probably heard about anyway, but it, it is actually originated from back in those days and... And there's a few kind of really prominent people in it. But yeah, let, let's go through that. So, um, I mean, um, you, you, I think you talk about so your trichotomy of control, negative visualization, setbacks and framing. Um, yeah. yeah let, let, do you want to go through that? or? Yeah, yeah. sure. So the trichotomy of control just refers to, um, you can basically group 
things or events that happen in life or in our lives into things that we control and things that we don't control. And then there's kind of a middle middling sphere where we can influence but can't control it. So I guess you could picture it as a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. Um, An example of that would be like a patient comes in unwell for an emergency case, so we're a late addition from another team. Or similarly, like if a patient deteriorates unexpectedly on ward call, um, when you take a step back and you think, well, it's important just to accept this patient's status as is. It's not like they chose to be unwell. Um, and you just do what you can to the best of your ability, and that's what you can control. So you can't control that they're unwell, um, at least them presenting, but you can control you know, how you approach them and doing, doing things to the best that you can. And so you avoid wasting time and energy over things that you don't control. So their late presentation to the hospital, maybe they came in after hours, um, but there's nothing you can do about it. And so it's it's very similar to the maxim like, don't cry over spilt milk, but it's also recognizing where we can avoid spilling further milk. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And like, let's say in that analogy, you've got, you know, maybe you've got 50 cases on the emergency board and this really sick patient comes in. What are the things that you can do then to control that you can control and you can kind of make your life easier? Yeah, so I think it's really helpful just to like delegate where appropriate um, and really set expectations clear. Um, where a bit of bit of like mindful listening is always helpful in this situation. Uh, so if you take a step back and say to the team that's come in with the new patient, you you can say something like, "Hey, look, like I understand this patient's." deteriorating and want to do the best we can for them but at the moment we also have many other things so it's just a matter of prioritizing between those yeah and i like that what you've written here you know you can you can affect your own strategy you can be punctual you can you know have your notes about the particular pathology and maybe a methodology of what to what to do for that case you can have your drugs ready you can have the machine checked and your nurses prepped and um, and you know everything else, and even maybe call the retrieval services if, if it's a smaller hospital as well. So uh, yeah, I, I think I totally see that. And one of the things you see is like you know when like let's say the emergency board gets really full, it's kind of nice in anesthesia where you just get a patient at a time. You literally can't do more than that. And so you know the fact that there's 50 patients waiting, which you know doesn't happen in my hospital, thank, thank goodness. But you know you can't actually fix that. It's a system problem. Yep. You just need more staff and theaters and operating time and everything so yeah worrying about that kind of stuff just isn't 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 going to be useful at all uh, yeah i think just a thing that um propagates from what you've just said is that you can only really you're only really in charge of your situation then and there um or like your day then and there and that also extends out to non-clinical situations in anesthesia so to get through anesthetic training, you have to pass the primary exam. And in my study group of six, um, you know, like day to day, people can get pretty down because when you take a step back and you look at everything that you have to learn, it can be pretty overwhelming. But I think just recognizing that you're not going to learn everything in one day. Um, you just take, you can only really control your preparation and your focus for that day. And so you just uh, concerned with that day, chipping away day by day, and that's how you progress through. Yeah, I think we always say you just trust the process. Like this is one of those marathons that you know you keep training, but you can't run that marathon yet, and you don't even see how you could possibly do it. But then suddenly you, you start remembering things, and you start being able to categorize properly, and and suddenly yeah. it it falls into place, and you just have to trust the process and learn, learn, learn diligently. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe that. So that's that was essentially the trichotomy of control to things we yep. control, things we don't control and things we influence, but can't control. So that's the trichotomy of control. How about negative visualization? What was that about? So it's a, it's a technique that I use a couple of times a day and I find it quite useful when you have setbacks or obstacles. Um, and so you take your situation, think about the large amount of possibilities that could be worse. Uh, often this is helpful just in a quiet moment, say when you're on tea break or um, if you have a break, like a lunch break, and you can think about it with your eyes open or closed. Sometimes the eyes closed helps you to visualize the alternate situation. And when you open your eyes again, then suddenly you realize like often your situation is, you know, you can manage it and you can deal with it. You know, it might not be a lot of fun, but it could always be worse. So an example is um, 
again, if we go back to the emergency board, if it's a busy day, it can literally always be worse. Uh, if you get called about two epidurals, you can always get called about three or four or five. And like one of my friends, Steph, she got called for five in a row um, on night shift. So like I always think when I get called on a day shift for three, that I could always have been her. Um, and then probably another one that's quite relevant to some of our listeners would be unmet call. So uh, this is something that uh, is worthwhile like quoting in anesthetic interviews as uh, stress minimization because one of my consultants, she would always, on the elevator to a met call, she would always picture a cardiac arrest. And so when the doors opened and it wasn't, then it was literally just not a life or death situation, which was a, lo- a lot easier to handle. Yeah, A bit of a relief. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, uh, I was thinking about this in terms of um, kind of fractured NOFs are often are sick as patients and you know they're obviously very high perioperative mortality but generally they're pretty okay in the in the theater but there's plenty of times we, we do these cases and the blood pressure drops substantially and and you know it, it is probably more you know, just one of the more high intensity things that we do but it's it's also one of those things that proves to us how capable you know patient physiology is but also how capable anesthetist and the team is of keeping someone alive during that difficult time so when I, whenever i get a tricky patient i just reflect back on Oh, I've seen worse. I've seen some of the sickest patients and they always get through. We always get them through. And that makes me feel better about this current patient in front of me. Um, so, Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, actually, one of the other things, so this, you got to not fall into the trap, I think, with it's negative visualization, but not uh, putting t- so much effort and pessimism about it. It's almost like I, I know it is bad and I'm not being upset by that. I'm just being relieved by it. I'm not putting a lot of emotion into a negative state saying, you know, you know, yeah, the, the worst thing to do would be to constantly be, what is it like, like Eeyore and, you know, in Winnie the Pooh, just everything is bad and everything. That, that's the, definitely the wrong end of this. This is not pessimism. This is literally going, oh, I've got a scenario. It's bad. And oh, it could be a lot worse. Thank goodness. It's not that. And it's a, po- it's a positive state of mind, even though it's causing negative visual- visualization, I think. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Hey, so, um, how about setbacks and tr- and framing? How do you how do you utilize that? So I think one thing that's um, interesting about cells in to me personally is that it opened my eyes just to the reality that in life there's there'll always be challenges and setbacks, and in in a way this is what makes life interesting and rewarding. And actually, you could take uh, the word life in that sentence and just take it out and put anesthetics in like there'll always be challenges and setbacks. And that's probably what makes it interesting and rewarding Mm -hmm. um, realistically. And so with these um, obstacles and adversity, stoicism teaches you to embrace these Mm -hmm. uh, because they'll always be there. And so you actually view them through a positive light. So for me personally, I didn't get onto anesthesia training my first application. And so I guess a snapshot reaction would be, you know, it was disappointing um and it was a bit of a setback but when i stepped back and thought about it and viewed it through this lens of framing um then i realized it was actually quite useful for a couple of things like firstly i it was great to go through that interview process um and so the next time i got it a year later i was very familiar with the process knew how it worked um the cv points that i'd accumulated for audits and presentations they flowed on Mm -hmm. It just go go by the wayside. And so they weren't wasted in any way. And I was also just a more experienced doctor when I made on to anesthesia training, which is always helpful. Um, and I also had the opportunity to know more about the primary exam. And so I was able to sit after my first six months. Um, and so they all mm. kind of coalesced into a very useful opportunity, whereas previously, maybe five, 10 years ago, when I was introduced to Stoic philosophy, then I might've just took the step back Without realizing realizing that it was an opportunity for growth. Yeah, yeah right. I, I completely agree. It's very hard to know whether when something happens, whether this bad. You know, you don't know if something's bad or good until potentially many weeks, months, years afterwards, because you just don't know what that problem or that setback actual, you know, branch onto as a separate thing. You know, I remember I mean, there's, there's stories about. I'm pretty sure Talia Connor that one textbook they use. I, I, there's rumors about them failing multiple at times their exams therefore they came up with this and made it a book and now you know it's it's a it's a big thing or maybe that's just a rumor but um i know that i i 
I really struggled in my part two exam or my final exam. And because I had to work so hard and it was so difficult, that's what became the Viber Bootcamp for the final course. And, and you know, if I didn't have, if, if it was natural to me, all this teaching probably wouldn't have happened because it was a challenge and difficult. I had to work through it in a very measured way, which probably is, is far easier to teach if you had to go through that struggle as well. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think in in my own practice, I've benefited immensely from people who have like overcome obstacles. So Katarina is one of the trainees, I think, in your own stands network. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, she shared her Viva notes, which had about 150 Viva stems, which is incredible, mm-hmm. along with her own answers to them. And they were just be useful. They were pretty much our gold standard document for the six weeks. Between the oh, written- that's amazing. <laughs> Actually, even, I mean, if you think about COVID, like the literally ABC's anesthesia would not be what it is without COVID because suddenly I had to go online and suddenly you don't get, you think, of, you know, that was obviously a terrible time and lots of tragedy happened. But then on the flip side, there's so much good that happened as well. Um, and it's it's really hard to quantify these things. But, um, you know, the fact that now you can just, that we wouldn't be reaching out to people uh, in many different countries talking about this if COVID hadn't happened because people d- just weren't forced to go online with a lot of these things and learn all these different ways of, uh, uh, I guess, sh- showing media. Yeah. Um, hey, so yeah, this probably all links in pretty well. Like I always feel like stoicism is a, is often the strategy for getting through these things or to try and make yourself in a better emotional state. But mindfulness really is the potentially the the way you identify that you're having a problem maybe so how, how do you how do you see mindfulness and how it kind of interlinks with everything yeah sure so I think it's just worthwhile just um, delving on the fact that mindfulness and meditation are slightly different things so mindfulness is kind of a approach to life just like stoicism is approach to life and meditation is the practice of uh, mindfulness um, during like a set time where you often observe your thoughts and you have focused attention and you just see that thoughts and emotions rise um, spontaneously. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess the two main things that are very relevant to myself would be that um, through mindfulness, I've realized that thoughts are fleeting and not necessarily a reflection of what your own beliefs are. And so one thing I use pretty extensively at um, work is the Hungry Angry Late Tide acronym. Um, Sorry, yeah, it's a halt. Everyone, every, you got always got to worry. If yep. uh, you got to halt before you start anything, because if you're H A L T, hungry, angry, late, or tired, then chances are things could go worse because you're at risk. Yeah, and then the other thing that's quite useful for me personally is um, mindful or active listening. So just allowing, like, facilitating a two to three second pause when someone asks me something, mm-hmm. and then um, that allows me time to respond. If you wanted me to talk in detail about either of those. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Tell me about both of those. Yeah, sure. So with regards to the thoughts, you one can learn this through meditation, like simply observing, sitting, sitting in silence and just realizing at any time your monkey brain is just thinking, concocting different things. And you just develop an insight into how your mind works. And so I found this quite useful in... In the Queensland interviews, at least a, for an anesthesia training, a recurring theme is how do you minimize stress? Um, how are you going to deal with adversity? And so I would quote both Stoic philosophy, but also mindfulness. And I'd say, and I found this quite useful. Personally, it's quite um, relaxing on tea breaks. It just helps slow everything down and really helps clear my mind um, during these situations. And it's in one of Ansgar's um in Queensland, they expect you to know the Wellbeing Special Interest Group documents pretty well. And there's one on personal health issues and strategies, and they say you should develop stress management and minimization techniques. So in my interviews, I said I'd read that document, and thankfully I'd had those in place, including mindfulness and meditation, mm-hmm. which are some of the examples that they give. Kind yeah. of tied in with that. So I think that, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm such a big fan of mindfulness. I think there's just no better way of, training your mind to realize what you're thinking. Like if you, you know, if you think of in any given minute, hour, day, your thoughts just just race to something. And you, you're not even aware that you're you you, you know you're thinking about this. And you, you're pretty much in, in this constant state of daydreaming. And often it's because of negative negativity bias. You're often thinking of the worst case scenarios. And there's the I feel like the only training ground, the only way to really catch yourself doing that 
is through the practice of mindfulness. And, you know, the training for that is essentially meditation of some sort. And, you know, the fact that that that's something that I do regularly now means that, oh yeah, I didn't catch myself worrying about the next case when I've got a case in front of me right here, or, you know, thinking about what's going to happen next week or what someone said to me that offended me, you know, yeah. it's like, you know, well, yeah, I'm thinking about that. That's, that's not useful for me. Great. I'm going to choose not to think about it, even though it's spent, you know, the difference between a thought spending a minute or five minutes versus one second is a massive difference. And I think it's just so important that, you know, you're aware of your thoughts. I mean, that's pretty much your whole world is comprised of your thoughts and what you make of them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, this is a mind blowing in touch for me. Um, but just that anger, no matter how long it lasts, it's because you're choosing to feed it. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of situations, say in a week where you might have a flashpoint of anger, but beyond the initial five second reaction, you can only become angry because it's like a fire where you need to give oxygen, you need to give fuel. And so that would be more angry thoughts, more, um, the word escapes me, but where you dwell on that situation and you don't kind of let it go. Yeah, and the separation, you, I guess. Yeah. yeah, mindfulness teaches you that all those thoughts don't necessarily re- reflect what you truly value. And so you learn that anger, ang- angry thoughts as well, you can kind of let them by the wayside. Excellent. Yeah. So then, and then, yeah, go on. I'll just with the hungry, angry, late tired. So this is again, very quotable in interviews. And so I use it all the time. And you kind of mentioned if someone's a bit abrupt in an interaction, uh, instead of meeting fire with fire, I usually pause and I run through the acronym. So I know if I'm hungry, angry, late or tired, chances are it's probably me. That's the irritable one rather than them. And then I often take a step back and think, I run through the same checklist for them. So I know if it's late in the day if they're, and they're going to be tired, mm. um, then it's probably... Like they also would have a situation where it would make them quite irritable, like midwives with distressed patients. It often they can't help it, it rubs off. And generally, once I run through that checklist for me and checklist for them, which takes two seconds, Mm. uh, one of the boxes will be ticked. (laughs) So I think that's it's pretty important just to keep in mind so that you're not always, you know, meeting abruptness with abruptness as well, that you can take a step back and realize, oh, you know, like, it's the situation. It's not really them or me. Mm. Uh, yeah, it really, it really is this form of empathy when you realize that. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, I think a few of the listeners are going to be thinking, "Hey, hold on, isn't hungry, angry, late, and tired? Isn't that pretty much every healthcare professional most of the time?" I mean, the system is always over, you know, overbooked, and <laughs> you know, the supply demand is just all always out, and we're always late to something. Which you know, we work long shifts, and it's just go, 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 um, and you know. Maybe that's that's probably one of the best things about this that you really have to check yourself even when you're incredibly busy. And maybe maybe that's where you know you you know the most important things you 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 have to focus on those. And maybe all the little things that you're mindful that you're not you know taking so much time um, on the trivial things of your day that you leave those for later and address the really important stuff straight away while you're still fresh. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think just within the HALT acronym too, I find drawing back to the things you can control, you can only really control the first two that you're hungry and angry. Um, and then if you're late, then you just control the situations where you get, you can be punctual. But if you have something else, then that's the way it is. And if you've worked a long day, then that's also the way it is. But like I often like have a snack if I'm on a pain round or something like that, just so awesome. that I know that I'm the best that I can be. Yeah. Uh, I used to always have muesli bars yeah. in my pocket. Like I, I, just, I just always get hungry on a ward round, and uh, yeah, you've, you've got to have a strategy. And often the um, oh, the um, catering ladies who go around, they're often amazing for giving you little uh, juice packs or or biscuits as well. So <laughs> that's good. Uh, mindful act and active listening. Have we already gone through that? Uh, a little bit. So it, there's yeah, a bit of an overlap right. with this as well. So it's basically. This is kind of Tim's spin on mindfulness, um, oh. where you have about a two, three second pause uh, after someone speaks to respond. And so if you're, it's quite useful if you're the ward call, the anesthetic red on call, and someone approaches you for something. Um, it serves a couple of purposes. Firstly, it allows the speaker to actually finish their thought process. 
Uh, sometimes they're just pausing. Sometimes they still have more to say. And so you never want to cut people off unless you're in a gigantic rush. Mm. Um, and it also allows the listener, so me, to absorb and digest what the other words were. Mm. And it, it also gives me time to think about my response. Um, so I think uh, an example of this would be if I'm very thoughtful, then I always use how and why questions instead of, sorry, how and what questions instead of why, which generally promotes a defensive response. Nice. So I'd always say like, oh, like what made you reach this conclusion or how did you get to this conclusion instead of why did, why do you think this? Um, and so that, that also helps with the, with the optimal response. Um, and because your default is just to formulate a response during, and that's not always optimal, particularly in a high stakes situation. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I would say the fourth thing is that uh, the gap, the silence allows me to step into their shoes of whoever's requesting whatever. So they also have their own time pressures, they also have their own skill set, their own checklist of things to do. And as you said, I think on this channel quite a few times, like we're all in here trying to do a juke. Um, good job, but sometimes there are circumstances kind of beyond our control um, or beyond our capabilities, and that's just the way it is. Yeah, yeah I think that's great. Actually, that's I mean, I love actionable strategies, but yeah. like just yeah, just saying, oh, how, um, how did you come to that conclusion, or, or what made you come up with that? It does it does feel gentler than why, but it probably also you know, matters the way you say it and that you have a certain empathy in the way you're expressing yourself, but. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I feel like I've heard that somewhere before, but um, yeah, it's such a subtle thing, isn't it, to ask? Yeah, I think it compounds as well. So if you're taking a step back and you're choosing specific language, your body, your body will also mirror. So if you're trying to be approachable and um, uh, I guess like friendly and candid, then probably your tone of voice and your pace will reflect that. Whereas if you just go to the default, then you just get whatever your mind can cox for that moment. Yeah. yeah. So just be quite mindful of your language also rubs off, I think, on your body language and the nonverbal stuff. That's quite important too. Excellent. Hey, Tim, thanks so much because I think we've covered so many things, especially about you know, stoic philosophy, how it actually impacts on us day to day in the healthcare profession and medicine and anesthesia. Um, and you know, also the fact that it's, you know, great for, I think, just for your well-being, but also from a practical point of view for interviews, just having these things to say to very, you know, very good answers to very common questions. I, I think I think that's just really useful. Um, if someone wanted to like listen or read more about this kind of stuff in a bit more detail, any any things you'd recommend? Yeah, absolutely. So for mindfulness, uh, there's I use two apps. Um, firstly, there's the Waking Up app by the philosopher Sam Harris. Uh, and there's also the Headspace app, which is quite common. Uh, you can kind of get a preview of eight episodes by Netflix, um, ironically. Uh, but then they also offer, I think, a 30-day trial for both. Um, they're just apps on your phone. They're very useful to pull out at work. Um, and they cater for everything, really. So they have guided and non-guided meditations. Sam Harris also has a lot of, a few interviews about Stoic philosophy. So it's kind of a blend of both. Does he actually, um, he actually... Talks to William B. Irving, doesn't he? In that, yeah, yeah. So William B. Irving's an author. So there are two authors that I'd recommend. Firstly, there's Ryan Holiday. So the book that the hero um, showed at the start is called The Daily Stoic. It's just very digestible, small portions that are catered for a day-to-day schedule. Um, and then there's William B. Irving. So he writes A Guide to the Good Life and also The Stoic Challenge, which my girlfriend loves. Um, and so they're both books where they take what's written in Stoic philosophy thousands of years ago, but they make it very relevant to the modern modern day. Yeah, I love that. Um, and there's something I did at the very start of Code, which was the the science of well being. It's an online course from oh, Yale. Yeah. It's actually the most subscribed course in Yale, funnily enough. Um, and it's um, yeah, the the author of that course, I forget her name, but she's Santos. She runs. Yeah. She runs an even more successful podcast than ABC's of Anesthesia. Um, it's called. I, I, I can't the, imagine why. <laughs> it's called the Happiness Lab. For anyone who's uh, interested, it has about four or five seasons. It's quite excellent, um, and it's yeah. all about, yeah. As as Leo said, science of well being. Yeah, the science well, and I've got to say that course was exceptional. I, you know, I completed it straight off. Um, the, just the the detail and the simplicity of what they had. It was kind of combining Stoic philosophy with mindfulness with a lot of other very useful facts 
And again, it was, it was science-y. It had actual data and facts. So I've got some great summaries of it, um, which I might post off at some stage. But um, yeah, no, that's great. Hey, so Tim, I can't thank you enough for your time. I think that was a really good time. A lot of people have finished their exams now and they're revving up for the next year. I think this is a great thing to lead up to learning, practicing, to just improve your well-being and, and yeah. just better in medicine and you know, taking care of your patients. So yeah, thanks very much for your time. And I'm sure we'll have you on for another episode in another stage. Sure. Thanks a lot, Larry. Thanks. So yeah, this is ABC Anesthesia. Please share with anyone who might be interested and we'll see you again next time. Thanks a lot. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey, from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well.